For generations, people have wondered about the Earth. Could our world once have been bombarded by meteorites like the ones that cratered the surface of the moon? Were dinosaurs the victims of a latter-day meteorite impact that caused mass extinctions? Could meteorites strike again and bring about a great cataclysm? Join us in a search for the meteorites that have shaped our world. They were here at our planet's birth and they've left clues of their return. The third planet from the sun, this time on the Miracle Planet. I'm Bill Curtis for the Miracle Planet. Billions of years of history have brought us to this moment. At any point along the way, the development of the Earth might have been diverted to follow a different course. Considering the odds, it's miraculous the Earth did not develop differently, becoming a blazing inferno like Venus or a frozen desert like Mars. Our planet is a world of vast and intricate systems of astonishing extremes, dense forests, and barren deserts, volcanic heat and glacial cold. The Earth is teeming with a million forms of life that have helped shape the very nature of our world, from the land under our feet to the air we breathe. In this series, we'll explore the unique combination of events and forces that have formed our planet and continue to shape it today. This huge crater in the heart of the Arizona desert is evidence of the power of these ancient forces. It was caused by the impact of a meteorite, a rocky fragment from space. These travelers through the universe hold a key to understanding how our world was formed and what our future may hold. In the middle of the Pacific Ocean, the snowy peak of the island of Hawaii rises above the clouds. This is Mauna Kea, the White Mountain. From the dormant volcanic crater on its summit, we can look down on the clouds gathered below or up into distant galaxies. At sunset, the horizon seems to extend forever. In fact, the high altitude of Mauna Kea and the clean mid-oceanic air make it possible to view the heavens with particular clarity as the high clouds dissolve in the evening sky. Yet as beautiful as it may seem, the sunset is just the prelude to the real show. Almost every night, the great doors at the Mauna Kea Observatory roll open, and some of the world's most powerful optical telescopes are turned on the night sky. Tonight, the telescope scans the surface of the moon. As early as 1826, the German astronomer von Greuthausen proposed that lunar craters were the result of meteorite impacts. But his credibility was undermined because he also proposed that other lunar features were built by a race of moon creatures he called selenites. In more recent times, the images from sophisticated telescopes and space exploration have led to the wide acceptance of the meteorite impact theory. During the last two decades, space probes have brought back evidence of tremendous meteorite cratering throughout the solar system. 
Craters were discovered on Mars and two of its moons by NASA's Mariner probes between 1965 and 1971. Images of Mercury from the Mariner 10 mission show the planet closest to the sun. Like our moon, Mercury is scarred with meteorite craters. The Voyager probe revealed a huge crater on Mimas, one of the satellites of Saturn. And on Enceladus, the ice-covered satellite of Saturn, the frozen surface is marked with thousands of meteorite craters. The numerous craters on the moons and planets in our solar system raises a basic question. Where did all the meteorites come from? A search for this answer leads to more fundamental questions and theories of how our solar system came into being. No one can be certain of what happened more than four and a half billion years ago. But many scientists now believe our solar system was born when dust and gases began to coalesce into a very hot disk. The center of the disk grew increasingly dense and bright, giving birth to the sun. Around the sun, other solid bodies formed, including an enormous number of planetesimals. They contained the raw material of the planets and ranged in size from a grain of sand to much larger protoplanets, several miles in diameter. According to one estimate, there were more than 100 trillion planetesimals in our solar system. Sometimes they collided. Upon impact, some planetesimals fragmented. But more often, they combined to form larger aggregate bodies. Over millions of years, these young planets continued to grow, collision by collision, to nearly their present size. As each one of the protoplanets grew in mass, the increase in its gravity attracted more of the remaining rocky fragments that crashed to the surface. This is how Mercury was formed, and Venus, and Mars. This is also how the Earth was formed.
At an early stage, the Earth was pockmarked with craters as meteorites rained down on its unprotected surface. The scars of those ancient meteorite impacts are still visible on the surface of the moon and other planets. Most have long since vanished from the Earth due to weathering and the continuing geologic development of our world. But evidence remains of more recent collisions of large meteorites with the Earth. In 1904, the first identification was made of a meteorite crater on Earth. The crater lies in the Arizona desert. David Moreau Berenger, a mining engineer, found meteorite fragments and sedimentary deposits that eventually led to dating the impact at between 25,000 and 50,000 years ago. The Berenger crater allows us to explore the kind of craters we see on the moon and marvel at the power that could create a giant crater like this in the batting of an eye. The meteorite that formed the Behringer crater was probably no more than a hundred feet in diameter. Yet it left behind a crater three quarters of a mile wide and 640 feet deep. Since Behringer's discovery, more than 100 terrestrial meteorite craters have been identified. They occur in all parts of the world but are particularly impressive in northern Canada. This ring-shaped lake is the scar of a meteorite impact long after the birth of our world. Across the terrain, the shapes of other craters are still discernible. One of the largest and oldest craters lies on the west side of the Ungava Peninsula in northern Quebec. First identified from aerial photographs by a prospector in 1950, the new Quebec crater is over two miles wide and 1,200 feet deep. The action of Ice Age glaciers and the weathering of time have obliterated all traces of the original meteorite. But it's estimated that a meteorite the size of a football stadium crashed into the Earth at 50 times the speed of sound. Even before Apollo 11's historic exploration of the moon, NASA began examining the mechanics of how craters are formed. Researchers simulate meteorite impacts in miniature. A bed of fine sand represents the surface of the planet. This projectile gun will fire an aluminum bullet into the target at five miles per second. That's 18,000 miles per hour. By analyzing experiments like this, we can understand the dynamics of how craters are formed. A high-speed camera records the impact of the projectile. As the simulated meteorite passes through the air in the chamber, it begins to glow brighter than the sun. On impact, this tremendous energy is released as heat, melting the projectile and the surrounding sand in a violent explosion. The shock wave is so powerful, it propels the sand outward at supersonic speed. From the point of impact, sand and molten material rise into the air.
In the sand of the laboratory, all traces of the impact are easily smoothed away. But when the impact occurs in solid rock, the evidence can persist for millions of years. This is Wolf Creek Crater in Australia. It was formed from a relatively recent impact only about 100,000 years ago. The dramatically eroded Gosses Bluff Crater of Western Australia shows how the weathering process eventually wore away most traces of our planet's primeval landscape. Sometimes, after a powerful impact pushes the floor of the crater down into the earth, it rebounds, raising a peak of rock at the center. At one of the Earth's largest known craters, Manicouagan Crater in Quebec, satellite photographs reveal a peak at the crater's center. Today, a lake surrounds the point of impact. Within the ring of water, a central peak rises above the trees on a large island. This is the central peak. It is 600 feet high and composed of solid rock that was forced up after the impact of a huge meteorite. At the foot of the peak, the shore also yields up some clues about the force of the collision. Dr. Dennis Roy of the University of Quebec's geology department has studied this crater and the effects of a meteorite strike. Near the central peak, rocks have been found that appear very similar to lava. Actually, it was molten rock from the impact that made a pool in the crater and then solidified as if it were erupted from a volcano. So that rock is very, very similar to a volcanic rock. But its composition and its position in the structure indicates an origin from melting after the impact. This same process has been observed on the moon. The central peak of the lunar crater Copernicus was also formed by a massive meteorite collision. The flat region around it was a depression filled with molten rock after the impact. This scenario has been played out on the Earth countless times, particularly in its early days. In that time, numerous planetesimals orbited the Sun. The primeval Earth must have been covered with craters. As the planet increased in size, it exerted a stronger pull of gravity. More meteorites were drawn to it at increasing speed. The great collisions caused intense heat that melted the surface, like the giant impact that created the Manicouagan crater. Gradually, over hundreds of millions of years, the face of the planet changed.
the incessant bombardment began to melt the outer crust of the Earth. Deep below the surface, growing radioactivity heated the planet from within. A sea of molten rock covered much of the Earth, obliterating many of the earlier craters. Our planet, born in the cold depths of space, had become a fireball. How different the Earth is today, four and a half billion years after the formation of our planet, we live in a mild environment, where the temperature hovers between the freezing and boiling points of water. Water can be found in one form or another almost anywhere on Earth, and it's the major component of virtually every form of life. But how did water emerge from a world of molten rock and falling meteorites? A clue may be found in the meteorites themselves. This is the Field Museum of Natural History in Chicago. It houses one of the world's most renowned collections of meteorites. Among them is the Murchison meteorite that fell in Australia in 1969. These fragments contain a sample of our primeval solar system, the hot gases and bits of dust that cooled and solidified. The Murchison meteorite caused a good deal of excitement because in it were discovered organic compounds from outside the Earth. It did not contain life itself, but rather amino acids, the building blocks of life. The meteorite also held within it another chemical compound that would change the face of the Earth. A simple experiment will reveal the secret. The sample is crushed and then heated to simulate what happens when a meteorite explodes on impact with a planet. The heat will release some of the gases trapped in the meteorite for billions of years. After about a minute, the glass vessel begins to cloud over as one of the meteorite's components begins to vaporize. A purified liquid is being extracted. This liquid is water, a surprising amount of which is released from even this small sample of a meteorite. The experiment helps focus attention on the role that early meteorites, the planetesimals, played in our planet's development from a fireball to a temperate world. Planetesimals continued to rain down on the developing planet, bringing water and other compounds, as they had for millions of years. Heated from above by the continual bombardment, the surface of the Earth became a sea of molten rock. Water locked within some of the meteorites vaporized on impact. Inside the Earth, radioactive energy generated intense heat, which emerged as volcanic activity. Through the tremendous heat, the great supply of water locked in the Earth from earlier planet-forming collisions was gradually forced to the surface. As the interior of the Earth became molten, the minerals began to separate. The denser ones, like iron, sank while the lighter compounds, including water, came to the surface and evaporated. 
Vast amounts of water from within the planet joined with carbon dioxide and other gases to form thick clouds. As the clouds rose above the surface of this changing world, the force of gravity kept them from dissipating into space. This was the origin of the Earth's primeval atmosphere. Gradually, the number of planetesimals striking the Earth declined, and the surface began to cool. The temperature of the atmosphere began to cool as well, and the moisture-laden clouds began to descend. As the surface temperature gradually fell, a landmark event occurred. For the first time on Earth, it began to rain. Torrents of rain fell on the still hot surface of the new planet. washed over the barren rocks and flowed down into the lowlands and broad plains. Eventually, the clouds broke, and the sun's rays spread across a new world, covered with broad blue oceans. The number of meteorites hitting the Earth has declined drastically since the planet's infancy, but occasional impacts may still occur. The Behringer Crater is one example of these latest collisions. This crater was blown out by a relatively small meteorite at that, only 100 feet in diameter. But what would happen if a truly massive meteorite crashed into the Earth? One controversial theory links meteorite impacts with evidence in the Earth's fossil record of a mass extinction. This global catastrophe occurred 65 million years ago wiping out many species of land and marine animals, including the huge creatures which then ruled the Earth. They were called dinosaurs, the Greek name for terrible lizards. These giant reptiles flourished for over 145 million years. By comparison, our period of earthly dominance has been a fleeting instant. The dinosaurs may have been the most successful higher form of animal life ever to inhabit the Earth. Now, only a faint shadow of their glory remains.
Today, dinosaur bones are found on every continent. These giants were widespread and able to survive in many climates and conditions. Characteristics of the once mighty dinosaurs are reflected today in reptiles like the land iguana found on the remote Galapagos Islands. Marine iguanas frequent the waters around the Galapagos. They're an ancient species that trace back to the time of the dinosaurs, though they are not believed to be direct descendants of the terrible lizards. Modern reptiles have developed from these independent lines since the catastrophe which destroyed the dinosaurs. No one knows for sure whether or not a meteorite caused the dinosaurs to become extinct. In fact, the theory remains controversial, partly because we have found no traces on land of a crater large enough to have produced such a cataclysm. But there is some supporting evidence for both the theory of an enormous meteorite impact and the theory of mass extinction. On the coast of Denmark, these high cliffs at Stevens Clint contain a geologic record that spans the time of the dinosaur extinction, about 65 million years ago. It is here, in the layers of sediment, that strong evidence can be found for the theory of mass extinction. The thin dark layer between the white clay below and the pink clay above was laid down at the time of the dinosaur's death. The clay layer has been studied by Dr. Finn Serlich of the Geological Survey of Greenland. It is a world famous locality in geology because it is the type locality of the Cretaceous tertiary boundary. In the upper part of the cliff, from here and upwards, we have the lowest part of the tertiary, and that is called the Danian, and it's named after Denmark. This is a so-called fish clay. It marks the boundary between the Cretaceous and the tertiary periods. The fish clay is starting with this very dark brown or black layer. We had a very profound change in oceanographic conditions. Something clearly happened. The clay above and below the dark layer holds many microscopic marine creatures, but the dark clay holds none at all. This layer, devoid of any evidence of life, is just one indication of the possible worldwide scope of the mass extinction. Here, on the Japanese island of Hokkaido, a search is underway for more evidence to support the global nature of this dark layer. A team of scientists from Tamagata University survey a rural hillside looking for the distinctive band of clay. Here, halfway around the world from Denmark, they discover a layer similar to the one found at Stevens Clint. Above and below this dark band, the whitish remains of fossilized plankton are abundant. Within the dark clay itself, however, there is no sign of life. When this layer was deposited on the ocean floor, plankton were absent from the sea. Only an event of gigantic and catastrophic proportions could account for such an occurrence. But is this mass extinction linked to the impact of a huge meteorite? 
If a huge meteorite were to collide with the Earth, it would throw up enormous clouds of dust containing material from the meteorite itself. If an impact of this size devastated the dinosaur's world, we should find traces of the meteorite in the lifeless layer of clay. At the University of California in Berkeley, Nobel laureate Luis Alvarez and his son Walter first proposed a theory in 1980 to link the mass extinction 65 million years ago with a giant meteorite impact. A team of scientists analyzed the various elements found within the clay. They collected 80 samples from all over the world. Their analysis of the dark clay revealed a significant fact. The clay contained unusually high amounts of iridium, an element normally found in very low levels at the surface of the Earth, but slightly more common in meteorites. Dr. Frank Asaro was one of the team that studied the clay samples at the University of California's Lawrence Laboratory. When we first discovered the iridium, uh, this was with the new detector, the big detector. We couldn't see it with the old ones. And we were very surprised because we didn't think we should see it. I didn't think we should see it. And it was a very large amount. And you couldn't explain that much iridium coming from the surface of the Earth, at least from what we knew at that time. So we said it had to come from uh, outer space. Iridium is found on the Earth as well, but most of it was carried toward the Earth's core during the planet's formation. According to Alvarez, one plausible explanation for its relative abundance in the dark bands of lifeless clay is the impact of a massive meteorite. The first samples of dark clay that revealed significant levels of iridium came from Gubbio, Italy. Iridium was later found in the dark band from the sea cliff of Stevens Klint in Denmark. One by one, similar samples of clay from all over Europe were found to contain iridium. Surface samples weren't the only ones to reveal the rare substance. It was also found in layers from the same time period formed on the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean and other sites around the globe. The slight but significant increase of iridium occurs in samples that date from 65 million years ago, at the time of the mass extinction. Scientists estimate that a meteorite containing iridium in the amounts discovered would have measured between 5 and 10 miles in diameter. But still the question remains, where did such a giant meteorite strike the Earth? A clue that may shed light on this question has been found at Caravaca, Spain. Here, in addition to the dark clay layer, there is also a narrow reddish band. Analysis has shown that the red vein contains materials that were probably formed by the massive melting of basalt rock on the ocean floor. This evidence, along with the absence of a huge crater on land, has led scientists like Dr. Jan Smit to speculate that the meteorite that may have killed the dinosaurs plunged into the ocean. What we see here at this ancient sea bottom, within this reddish layer, is our very tiny millimeter sites, uh, droplets which origin originate by the force and the energy of the impact at the Cretaceous tertiary boundary. The, uh, the force, the sheer energy of the impact melts a lot of uh, surrounding rock and this rock is thrown into the air into outer space it drops down on the seafloor where it's preserved as a solid layer. In the dark layer of clay scientists have also identified a type of soot produced by the burning of wood or fossil fuels. The amount of soot found in deposits from 65 million years ago is so large it suggests many of the world's forests may have burned during this period. This is what might have happened if a giant meteorite crossed the Earth's orbit and collided with the planet at a speed of about 70,000 miles per hour. 
Let's suppose the impact occurred at a location where the ocean is over 1,000 feet deep. A meteorite six miles in diameter would hit bottom a fraction of a second after touching the ocean's surface. As the meteorite collided with the Earth, the impact would have caused an extraordinarily violent explosion. The energy released would be equivalent to 100 million megatons of TNT, far greater than the explosive power of the combined nuclear forces of the United States and the Soviet Union. The center of the explosion would reach temperatures three times hotter than the surface of the sun. The heat generated by the impact would start forest fires that would destroy plant and animal life over a vast area. These fires would only be the beginning of the far-reaching effects of a huge meteorite collision. The shattered seabed and fragments of meteorite would spread around the earth in a tremendous cloud of debris. Along with the fine debris, water vapor would rise from the steaming ocean. The initial fiery holocaust would be followed by a long cloud-shrouded night when sunlight reaching the Earth would be only one-tenth the intensity of moonlight. Under these conditions, air temperatures near the surface would drop rapidly to below freezing. In the cold and dark, photosynthesis would stop and green plants perish, breaking the first link of the delicate food chain. Many creatures, including the dinosaurs, would die of starvation. First, the plant eaters would face a dwindling food supply. Then the large meat eaters would not find enough prey to survive. The clouds of a long global winter would shroud the earth. Gradually, the dust and water vapor from the meteorite impact would begin to settle out. The layer of lifeless clay would begin to sink to the ocean floor as the snow blanketed the ground. The temperature would gradually rise as more heat from the sun penetrated the thinning cloud. Snow would turn to rain, washing out even more of the remaining atmospheric dust. Only after several months would the clouds thin out enough to allow the sun to shine through on the earth again. A falling meteorite causing worldwide catastrophe. This may have been what killed the dinosaurs that reigned supreme on Earth for 145 million years. But dinosaurs would not have been the only casualties of the impact. 
the consequences also would have been felt in the sea. The darkness that enshrouded the planet would have a similar devastating effect on life in the oceans. Phytoplankton, essentially the grass of the ocean, would be affected in the same way as land plants. The darkness would kill them. This would be a mortal blow to the many species that directly or indirectly depended on plankton for their own food. After plankton ceased to photosynthesize, the oxygen in the ocean would fall to lethally low levels in many areas, further spreading the devastation. Marine life would die in incredible numbers. With the break in this critical link of the ocean food chain, many species of animals and plants would die out. Was this mass extinction really caused by a giant meteorite? Did the dinosaurs die out in a dark world of ash and clouds? And is this global catastrophe only one in a recurring cycle of mass extinctions caused by meteorite collisions with the Earth? More discoveries about meteorites and mass extinctions have galvanized the scientific world. In 1983, two University of Chicago paleontologists concluded that mass extinctions have occurred on a 26 million year cycle. And another study of the Earth's best dated meteorite craters suggests that the collisions seem to occur in a similar cycle. Because of the lack of conclusive evidence, it is still unknown whether meteorite impacts actually cause these extinctions. But we do know one thing for certain. Meteorites do continue to bombard the Earth. There's a saying in Mexico that the Mexican Earth invites meteorites. The Mexico City Museum displays some of the largest meteorites that have fallen on that country. This one weighs 14 tons and is almost pure iron. It was once at the core of a much larger ancient planetesimal. This fragment of the iron core eventually fell to the Earth after two planetesimals collided in space. Even today, fragments of massive planetesimals continue to fall to Earth. On the night of February 8, 1969, a shower of meteorites fell on the small Mexican village of Allende. Haga de cuenta que cuando venía el meteorito era de día, una iluminación como si fuera de día. Antes de caer, antes de caer vibraban las láminas, los techos de las casas antes de caer, y eso fue lo que nos hizo levantarnos, esas vibraciones que había en las láminas. Lámina, el cine, el, no, las, las ventanas metálicas, todo eso vibraban. Cuando esa iluminación se vio, ¿verdad? Se apagó la iluminación, entonces vimos el sonido que venía con ese tracateo que eran las piedras. Después lo vimos que eran las piedras. No sabíamos qué era ese tracateo tan, tan fuerte. Fue, fueron las piedras las que cayeron. These are a few of the meteorites that fell from the sky that night, but they will not be the last ones to hit our planet. Today, astronomers are scanning the skies for the remnants of huge planetesimals called asteroids that still revolve around our sun. An astronomical observatory sits on top of Mount Palomar in California. One of its functions is to monitor asteroids and plot their orbits.
For many years, research on the nature and movement of asteroids has continued under the watchful eyes of Dr. Eugene and Carol Shoemaker of the United States Geological Survey. Using a special camera and telescope with a wide visual field, they have identified 25 asteroids traveling on courses of particular interest. Each of these asteroids travels in an orbit that intersects the Earth's orbit. Although the probability is slight, if even one of the asteroids were to collide with the Earth as a meteorite, it would be disastrous. The film in the telescope's camera is exposed for many hours. Minute celestial bodies that are normally invisible to the naked eye can be seen as bright dots. Because an asteroid travels at an unusual speed and trajectory, it shows up as a short streak instead of a pinpoint of light. In March 1986, the Shoemakers discovered this asteroid. It's over one mile in diameter and made of iron. But the meteorite that may have killed the dinosaurs would have been five times this size. Is there a possibility that such a huge asteroid might strike again? Yes, there very definitely is a chance that a 10 kilometer asteroid will collide with the Earth in the future. They have in the past. On average, they've hit about once every 50 million years on the long-term average. So the expectation is there's a, there's a better than 50% chance that in, in the next 50 million years, uh, there will be another one of these that collide. We actually know of two asteroids right now. We've not discovered all of the Earth-crossing asteroids, but there are two of them that we know uh, that are about that size, each of which could hit the Earth. Uh, and in fact, there are even bigger asteroids. There's an asteroid called Eros, uh, which has about a 20% chance of hitting the Earth in the next several hundred million years. And this asteroid is about 20 kilometers in average diameter, so it would produce an even bigger effect. A Wyoming family took home movies of this meteor, whose weight is estimated at 1,000 tons. Fortunately, the meteor didn't collide with the Earth. It skimmed through the high atmosphere, leaving a white trail. If it had struck the Earth, the disaster would have rivaled a nuclear explosion. Today, a large meteorite collision with the Earth would be a major disaster, to say the least. But meteorites have played an important role in the development of our temperate world. Four and a half billion years ago, the combining of countless planetesimals formed the physical planet that we call Earth. They carried the building blocks of our planet. As their frequency declined, the Earth changed dramatically, and eventually great oceans of water covered the surface. Throughout the Earth's long history, periodic meteorite collisions may have dramatically affected the development of life on our planet, causing the extinction of some species and allowing others to succeed. Will a great meteorite change the Earth in our lifetime? Probably not. According to one theory, the next visit of huge meteorites isn't expected for another 15 million years. But no one knows for sure what may cross our path. From the very formation of our miracle planet, we are linked with the meteorites. <laughs>